All right, it's our last chapter of Listening to Crickets, a story about Rachel Carson by Candace F. Ransom, and we are on chapter five, Work That Has No End. Seven dead songbirds. Rachel let the letter fall to her lap and closed her eyes. She had much to think about. It was January, 1958. The letter that was distress, distressing Rachel came from a friend, Olga Owens Huckins. Ms. Huckins had witnessed a terrible sight. A plane had spewed a cloud of DDT over the small private bird sanctuary Ms. Huckins owned. The pesticide was supposed to kill mosquitoes. The powerful chemical wiped out the mosquitoes all right, but it also killed other insects and many birds. Mrs. Huckins picked up seven dead birds around her home, heartsick over the needless deaths of innocent songbirds. Alarmed, she had written a letter to the Boston Herald describing the incident and making a general plea to ban the spraying of pesticides from the air. When her letter was published in the newspaper, Mrs. Huckins sent a copy to Rachel Carson. In her personal letter to Rachel, Mrs. Huckins urged Rachel to find someone in Washington who could help control these senseless mass sprays. Rachel knew what had to be done. She would write an article warning about the dangers of pesticides. No, she had tried that years before after the war. Rachel had offered to write about the dangers of pesticides, but magazines had turned her down, even though she was a well-known author. She was told that advertisers who buy space and magazines would object to such a controversial piece. One manufacturer of canned baby food declared that an article such as Rachel proposed would cause panic among young mothers. People might stop buying their product. Companies weren't about to lose sales over a magazine article. An article wouldn't adequately cover such a vast subject anyway, Rachel felt. She would have to write a book. She had planned to write a book about the earth doing the continents, what she had done for the sea and the sea around us, but that project would have to wait. Her friends tried to discourage her from writing about pesticides. Who would want to read about such a dreary topic? Undaunted, Rachel began researching her subject. Pesticides are chemicals used to control insects and other pests. DDT, dichloro, diphenyl, trichloroethane, was the most popular pesticide. Widely used as a dust and a spray, DDT was touted as the wonder chemical. DDT saved time, money, and labor. Farmers, foresters, dairy people, and gardeners used half a billion pounds of the toxic substance per year. DDT declared war on insects. Crop-threatening insects lost. But so did harmless insects. Birds, rabbits, squirrels, muskrats, even farm cats exposed to the chemical. If DDT killed insects and small land animals, Rachel wondered what it was doing to fish. She found out the poisonous substance, which was washed by rainfall into creeks, also killed fish. Next, she asked what effect DDT would have on humans if they ate vegetables and fruits sprayed with the deadly chemical. If people poisoned their food to protect it, weren't they poisoning themselves as well? A dreary subject indeed, but Rachel felt there would be no peace for her if she kept silent. It wasn't just the issue of seven dead birds. All life seemed to be threatened by human progress but she would tackle the problem of pesticides first. Rachel needed help to find answers. She sought the advice and opinions of experts, biologists, naturalists, and other scientists that sent her information from all over the world. She hired an assistant to help with typing and note-taking. The book progressed slowly. Rachel sensed she would not have all the time in the world to write this book. Bouts of illness sometimes kept her bedridden for months. She gave up her bird walks and her hikes with Roger. All her energies were directed toward her work. In December of 1958, Mrs. Carson died, six months short of her 90th birthday. So she was 89 and a half. Not only did Rachel lose her mother, but she also lost her dearest friend. She remembered her mother's gentleness, the way she would put spiders out the door instead of killing them. She recalled how her mother encouraged her writing, hearing her mother's voice in her memory, urging her on. Rachel worked harder than ever to complete her book. She thought she would call the book Man Against the Earth, but that didn't sound quite right. The title that was decided on came right from the book. In the first chapter, Rachel asks the reader why the birds have stopped singing. What has silenced the voices that are the sound of springtime? And so the book was titled Silent Spring. Rachel mailed the completed manuscript to her publisher, never suspecting her book would change the course of history. Silent Spring was scheduled to be published in September of 1962, but that summer before the book arrived in bookstores, parts appeared in the New Yorker magazine. The reaction to Silent Spring was anything but silent. According to a headline in New York Times, Rachel Carson's book started a very noisy summer. The chemical industry was up in arms. Here was a book that could put them out of business. 
articles lashing out against Silent Spring attacked Rachel herself, saying she was a nature nut. Silent Spring did not receive the consistently glowing attention in which Rachel's earlier books had basked. The reviews swung from harsh criticism to high praise. While some reviewers declared that the claims made in Silent Spring were false, others were glad to know about dangerous chemicals. Letters flooded Rachel's mailbox. Readers demanded something be done about pesticides. The public clamored for Rachel to give speeches and grant interviews as before. This time, though, instead of simply autographing stacks of books, Rachel had to defend the conclusions she made in Silent Spring. She stood up against her accusers, and people began to listen and to recognize her achievement. On January 7, 1963, Rachel was presented with the Schweitzer Medal of the Animal Welfare Institute. This award meant more to her than any of her previous awards or any that would come later. Rachel had dedicated Silent Spring to Albert Schweitzer, a man who had devoted his entire life to serving humankind. Albert Schweitzer had a great respect and love for all forms of life. Rachel was proud to receive an award in his name. Meanwhile, the storm over her book continued. The racket over Silent Spring was heard in the White House. President Kennedy set up a committee to study environmental hazards. Rachel met with the committee members in January of 1963. The report, released the following May, agreed with Rachel's findings. As a result, hearings on pesticide control began in the Senate. Again, Rachel went to Washington to testify. The Senate was packed with photographers, reporters, and television cameras. One senator remarked upon meeting her that she was the woman who had started the ruckus. He implied it was hard to believe such a small, quiet woman had caused such a commotion. But when Rachel presented her facts, people were convinced she knew what she was talking about. Rachel spent the rest of the summer in Maine enjoying the peacefulness of the sea. Here, there were no television cameras pointing at her. There were no requests to give speeches. Lying on a blanket, Rachel watched the gulls wheeling in the sky. When the crickets began their end of summer song, Rachel and Roger went back to Maryland. In the first week of December, Rachel traveled to New York to pick up three awards. The hue and cry over Silent Spring had died down, but even as she was being honored, Rachel would not let people forget the purpose of her book. The National Audubon Society's medal represented rare praise. Rachel was the first woman ever to receive it. At the awards banquet, Rachel warned the guests that their work in conservation had no end. Next, Rachel received a medal from the American Geographical Society for her contribution to the cause of conservation. Then Rachel was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Throughout the writing and the defending of her book, Rachel battled ill health. She suffered a minor heart attack. Her old enemy arthritis plagued her, and most serious of all, she had cancer. <coughs> Roger was now 11. Rachel did not know how much longer she would be able to care for him, but as long as they had each other, she would make the most of every moment. In the early spring of 1964, Rachel was cheered to hear the song of the first returning Robin. Soon her yard would be filled with robins and thrashers, busily building nests and rearing young. Insects would hum in the rose bushes and her brother was planting in her garden. The grass would teem with life. After spring would come summer, a noisy, active, lively summer. Would she hear the cricket song? Rachel knew that she might not hear the crickets again, but she had accomplished much in her 56 years. She had done her best to preserve life. She had listened to the plant, planet and let other people know what she had heard. Every, even more important, she was part of the living, breathing, crawling, flying, walking, swimming, rooted thing called nature. For now, that was enough. <clears throat> Afterward, Rachel Louise Carson died of cancer on April 14, 1964. She left a legacy of memorable work, including bulletins, pamphlets, articles, essays, and books. In 1980, Rachel was posthumously, that means after her death, awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor a civilian can achieve by President Jimmy Carter. Her face graced a postage stamp in 1981. Schools in Maryland and New York bear her name. Rachel's name also heads a wildlife refuge, a nature trail in Pennsylvania, and several research ships. Even a peregrine falcon was named after her. Like her name, Rachel's work lives on. Though her books about the sea catapulted her to fame, it was Silent Spring that changed the way we view our environment. Conservation and ecology became household worlds. words. Conservation and ecology became household words. Silent Spring brought results. DDT and other related chemicals have been almost completely banned in the United States, Canada, and other developed countries. Though dangerous pesticides are still being produced, other methods of managing crop pests are being promoted, such as the use of natural enemies, like other insects or biodegradable in insecticides. 
The Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, was formed to enforce controls on land use, factory waste, and many other hazards to our environment. The Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act were passed to curb pollution, while the Endangered Species Act protects our vanishing wildlife. Silent Spring made us realize we have the power to stop damaging our planet and begin preserving our natural resources. But as Rachel cautioned fellow conservationists, it is work that has no end. We are also a part of the living, breathing, crawling, flying, walking, swimming, rooted thing called nature, and we must not forget it. I hope you enjoyed that book, and I hope it will encourage you to be a good steward of God's creation. Thanks for joining us.